Hey everyone. It's always exciting to have new members join us on the Shapoko forums and Facebook groups, and you'd be surprised how little time it takes for someone to go from overwhelmed beginner to a regular contributor providing advice to the next generation of Shapoko adopters. That said, it does mean we often see the same questions asked multiple times a week or occasionally even in the same day. I'm going to go through some of the more common questions and issues I've seen come up. To keep the video short, a lot of them I'll only touch on lightly, but you're more than welcome to ask questions in the comments or to join us in the aforementioned communities. I'll leave links in the description. If you're having trouble getting Carbide Create to accept the size of the stock, make sure you've set your Shapeoko machine model to the correct size. The default grid size in Carbide Create is a little unusual. Go to the job setup and hit edit document background and you can set a more appropriate grid size for your project. While it's better than it used to be, Carbide Create simulation is a bit rough and you should not assume that just because a defect shows up in the simulation that it will show up in your actual project. It's always better to utilize the actual toolpath preview as an indicator of how it will cut. If you set up a contour toolpath, even if you use a V-bit, Carbide Crate will not preview this correctly. It will profile it as if it's a standard bit. This doesn't mean it won't function correctly, it just means you won't be able to benefit from the preview. More than one person has accidentally overwritten their retract height with a value of zero when setting up their job sites. Frequently, the result of this is that they'll show us pictures where the bit has dragged across the surface of the wood, gouging it lightly as it did the job. The fonts available in Carbide Create are simply the system fonts available on your computer. If you want more options, simply download the font and install it as normal. In addition, if you want to scroll through some fonts to get an idea of what they'll look like, you can hover your pointer over the drop-down field and simply roll your middle mouse wheel. That said, a much better tool for finding a font that will fit the look you want is wordmark.it. By typing in any phrase, you can get a preview of that text in all the fonts installed on your computer. It's worth noting that not every font will be appropriate for CNC. Fonts with very thin details or with a lot of sharp points won't always carve well, or may require special considerations such as steeper angled V-bits. The default feed and speed rates, specifically the depth per pass, feed rate, and plunge rate in Carbide Create are extremely conservative. After you've run a couple jobs and you're certain the machine is mechanically sound, feel free to play with these numbers. Particularly, I feel you can at least double the feed rate and the plunge rate without any problem. After that, you can look into increasing the depth per pass and be able to make your cuts in fewer passes. A quick note on the retract height we talked about earlier. In addition to making sure it's not dropped to zero, it also doesn't need to be 10. The retract height is how high above the workpiece the bit is lifted as it moves between parts of the cut. If you don't have clamps on top of your material, you can drop this down to two or three and be safe. This will significantly decrease the amount of time the bit spends moving vertically between cuts. A lot of people find Carbide Create particularly limiting. Usually this is because their drawing tools are a lot more underdeveloped than their toolpathing tools. My personal recommendation is to learn a third-party vector program like Illustrator or Inkscape, as those skills will also transfer to other digital making. Carbide Create combined with Inkscape or Illustrator will take you a lot further than Carbide Create alone. Of course, if you still feel like you're limited by Carbide Create, eCarve and Vetric's entire line of products are also an option. If you switch to one of Vetric's products, note that you'll still probably use Carbide Motion to actually run your machine. You'll simply be using vCarve to generate the G-code. When you do go to save your G-code in vCarve products, use the Shapeoko Inch or Shapeoko Millimeter Post Processor. Either of these will work, it simply changes what units are used internally. 
the actual cuts will be the same. Regardless of whether you're using Carbide Create or Vetric products, if you do a job that requires multiple bits, you should export separate G-code files. Run one G-code file for your first tool. When that's complete, you can shut down your router, change your bit, and then load the second G-code file and run that one. I'll leave a link to a good guide on how to do this, but I'll note that while your X and Y zeroing will still be valid, you'll definitely want to redo your Z zeroing, as the amount of bits sticking out of the router will almost certainly change. You may eventually find yourself wanting to do something with drilling, something like a cribbage board or, or any project with a lot of holes. It's worth noting that end mills are not good at drilling, and drill bits are not good at surviving speeds that a router produces. Don't put a drill bit into your router, even if it seems to fit. They're just not meant for that speed, and they could overheat and cause other problems. Decarve gets around the limitation on drills by doing a peck drill. This is where the bit literally pecks at the wood. It descends, drills a small amount, and then lifts. This helps to clear chips, which is the biggest problem of drilling with a CNC. Carbide Crate doesn't give you this option, but what you can do is do a pocketing operation that's slightly larger than your bit. So if you want 1 8 inch holes, you could use a 1 8 inch end mill, but simply make your geometry slightly bigger, 0.13 inches instead of 0.125. By doing a pocketing operation, it will cause the bit to slightly move inside the hole it's drilling. It will then lift just like with a peck drill and then descend further. As a final note on software, Every once in a while, we have somebody download Carbide Motion 3. All of the newer Shapeoko machines for the last several years have shipped with a newer version of Gerbil and are meant to be paired with Carbide Motion 4. Using Carbide Motion 3 with the newer board is unpredictable, to say the least. There's a few different sets of assembly instructions floating around, but unfortunately it's easy to find older and outdated ones, which isn't to say the newest ones are perfect either. Hopefully we'll see some improvement on this in the coming year. For example, one of the instructions that's out there forgets to tell you to tighten things down. It has you leave all the bolts loose until the machine is mostly assembled so that you can square the machine, but neglects to actually tell you to square the machine and tighten the bolts down. Make sure you're not turning on your machine before you've squared it and tightened down the screws. We'll frequently have people tell us that when they move the gantry, it doesn't move smoothly. Magnets and electricity have a symbiotic relationship. The same way that electricity applied to the motor can cause it to move, moving the motor can actually create electricity. If you move the gantry by hand with the belts attached, it can generate just enough electricity to turn on the controller and the motor just for a moment. If you want to be certain, take the belt off or loosen it so that it's not contacting the pulley. If it still moves rough, then you may actually have a problem. If that solves it, then it's almost certainly that you're moving the gantry too fast by hand and the electricity generated is kicking on the motor. When you install your limit switches, do a reality check. Physically move the gantry to the back, right, up position and make sure that each of those positions depresses the correct limit switch. The machine has no other way to know when it's reached the edge of the machine. Which leads me to a related point. Especially when you're first turning on the machine, if you hear it making a grinding noise, shut it off. The grinding noise is the pulley skipping on the belt. The machine is happy to destroy its own belts if you don't shut off the power. This is almost always the limit switches, either mechanically, meaning the switches aren't being depressed, or electrically, meaning they're not connected to the right place on the controller board, or not connected at all. Some of the usable Y-axis is actually in front of the machine, almost two inches. You can create a waste board that overhangs the front or use this for some clever solutions like edge joinery. But in general, it's just good to be aware that that is why your Y-axis doesn't seem like it has quite the reach it should. The points located by rapid movements inside Carbide Motion aren't necessarily the exact extents or center of the machine. Some people find it useful to mark those locations on your wasteboard if you find yourself using them often. While the instructions will tell you correctly that it doesn't matter mechanically, put the screws for your router mount on the right. Some accessories assume that they're on the right. For example, until recently, the JTEC Photonics 
laser mount only worked if the screws were on the right. That's no longer the case, but it would still be good for the community to settle on a standard. It's okay for the Z-axis to slide up and down easily when it's not powered on. Some people expect that the springs will return it all the way to the top position, but it's actually meant to be neutrally buoyant, kind of like an elevator. You want as little resistance as possible so that the motor has an easy time moving it up and down. Make sure you take a minute to tighten the eccentric nuts and to understand what's actually going on. Because they're so often an issue, I'm going to take a moment to discuss the adjustment of the eccentric nuts. The eccentric nuts run along the bottom of the aluminum extrusions that make up the axes. The V-wheels on the top and bottom essentially pinch the axis between them. And it's important that these be snug against the extrusion. On the right here, the gray circle represents the V-wheel. And the pink portion represents the nut that's adjustable and visible on the front of the plate. You'll notice that the V-wheel is offset from the center of the nut, which means as you rotate this, you're actually adjusting the position of the V-wheel up or down, depending on what is snug against the axis. This is a side view of the same thing. If I were to spin that, what you would see is the V-wheel moving up and down as I rotated the eccentric nut. If you don't have these adjusted properly, it leaves a small gap here. That gap, in turn, allows the router plate to slide forward and back. We'll often have videos people post where they can do this exact motion that I'm demonstrating with their physical machine. This can be either a forward and back motion or a side to side motion, depending on how each V-wheel is set up. If one side is tight, it might allow the, only one side of the gantry to rise or lower. If both are, it will likely allow a lot of movement. If these are properly tightened, then the mechanisms shouldn't be able to move other than directly along the axes. You will almost certainly want a supplementary wasteboard, something that goes on top of the machine wasteboard that you can flatten. As of when I'm creating this video in February 2019, Ben Myers has created an excellent toolkit that you can use to create your wasteboard, a fence, and so on. I'll leave a link to his materials in the description. Looping back to the limit switches for a moment, on the XL and XXL, the machines that have drag chains, you may find that the limit switch on the X axis hits the drag chain. A very common solution to this is to mount the limit switch on the inside of the plate instead of the outside. There's no magic here. As long as the switch is depressed before the gantry hits the edge of the axis, it'll work fine. When inserting your bit into the collet, make sure at least enough of the bit is inserted that the entire collet is grabbing onto a piece of the bit. You don't want half the collet grabbing the bit and half the collet grabbing air. Beyond that, as a general rule, you don't want more bits sticking out than you need, but it's not as important as making sure the collet is firmly securing the bit. If you cut a lot of plywood or material that splinters or frays when cut, look up how down cutting and compression bits work. It's also important to note that they're not a magical fix-all, and there's reasons why you would use an upcut bit. But for a lot of operations, especially in plywood, a downcut bit will provide a much better result. You can't use a probe for X and Y when using a V-bit. Instead, you can use a normal end mill, such as a simple 1 quarter inch end mill, to probe for X and Y, and then you install your V-bit and you can probe for Z. If you switch to Vetric products, you will not be prompted to insert the tool when hitting start in carbide motion. Carbide create inserts an additional G-code command that asks you for the tool. Most people reasonably assume that that's a feature of carbide motion. When you switch to VCarve, you lose that entirely and you should have your router running when you hit start. Once you generate the G-code, most of the computer's thinking is over. The machine itself will not intelligently recover from improperly set zeros, hitting the edge of the cutting area or a limit switch, losing steps for any reason, and so on. Once the G-code is generated, the rest of the thinking is really done by you, and the machine is only executing the exact instructions given to the best of its ability. 
If you're having trouble with the machine disconnecting during the cut, you may have electromagnetic interference issues. A shielded USB cable may help, but, but you probably already got one with your Shapeoko. There's a large discussion on the wiki, forums, and Facebook groups, as this is a very common question, and you should definitely search for that information before you start another thread on the subject. If your V-carves are coming out with rounded points to them, it's almost certainly an improperly set zero or an uneven material. The belts can wear out, so can the V-wheels in several other parts. If you're using your machine in a production or semi-production environment, it's worth making sure you have extras of these materials on hand. Carbide 3D sells an actual maintenance kit, or you can find the parts often cheaper individually elsewhere. The consumable parts of the machine also include the brushes on your router. A lot of people don't realize those are consumable and they do need to be replaced when they wear out. The brushes are not expensive, they're usually 15 to 20, often for four of them, where you use two at a time. But they're definitely the kind of thing to have on hand if you don't want downtime. Your machine is going to produce a lot of sawdust, and you're going to want to clear it out when you start to see it building up. Canned air and vacuums work great for this, especially with a focus on the belts and the V-wheels, as the dust does tend to accumulate there. You'll almost certainly want some kind of dust collection option if you've just bought your machine. These days, there's an awful lot of different companies providing dust shoes. The Suck It Dust Boot Company has been at it for quite a while, but in the intervening years, several other options are available, often cheaper and often available without as much of a delay. If you don't want to spend money on a commercial one, there are ones you can 3D print at home, or of course, you do own a CNC machine. I've even seen people cobble them together out of cardboard and old soda bottles. As long as it doesn't interfere with the actual machine, any option is better than none. I end this video with the full understanding that as soon as I post it, I'm going to think of a dozen more things I wish I'd said. If you can think of anything that you think new Shapeoko users need to know, you can share it in the comments below. As always, thank you for watching, and if you haven't yet, please consider subscribing.